Is this um, presentation going to be on that board? Okay. Yes, it will be. And I'll just just kicked it off with the recording there. So I'll certainly put the slides up. And um, if, if the video book comes up OK, I'll post that as well. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got access to which courses you guys are on. So in the worst case, just email me and I'll put it in a Dropbox or something like that. So it's interesting you guys are the first slot to hear this. And uh, a lot of these comments that I've put in here are really from just observing your cohort going through last year and things. So uh, I'll be really interested in your own feedback, actually, on and anything that you think might be missing as well. But I hope it'll be helpful to you. So uh, I'm going to repeat this to several different classes. So it's, it's also sort of tweaked for group presentations and things like that. So for, for you guys doing your masters, you're doing your masters anyway. So it should only have to come in handy. So I just want to have a few observations, a few tips, the sections that, expect, that you might expect in some of this stuff. Do's and don'ts, and some excellent cautionary tales that I've seen uh, in the last 12 months, in all my 12 months in academia. <coughs> so, the first thing that I've, I've seen enough reports already in the last 12 months to know that, depending on whether you're a glass half empty, glass half full kind of guy, uh, you can either a bad report can really ruin a good project. And the number of times where I've seen a great project and teased it out and sort of viva and things like that, that actually it was a great project in spite of everybody's best efforts to hide the fact in the report, that it was a dreadful report. So the flip side of that is, your material might be indifferent, but there's still a very good opportunity to get a few marks back Quite a, quite a few marks back with a good report as well, and I'll and I'll say what I mean by that. So I don't know if you prefer the carrot or the stick. I mean, this is the first thing I think I, I really want to stress is the best thing you can do is start early with a report. It's very tempting to say, right, we're going to leave it till the last minute and then sit down and, and write it. And I've seen some absolute shockers from people who've done that. Because the main point is, it's easier to do it this way. This was a trick that I was taught when I was about 17, went on a report writing course in my industrial placement. And they, and they put it up to me, uh, and they showed me this, and build up this collection of bits and bobs, just open a brand new Word file, and every time something pops into your head that, think, that you think would be a good nugget of information to go in, just get it down. Just, just scribble it down. So the example I've given here is, this is me building up my collection of points I wanted to make for this presentation. And so I started off with a, with a Word file, and every time I thought of something, I just zapped it down. It took me a couple of weeks, and it was no effort at all. And it was, it was actually quite and weight off your shoulders, actually, because as soon as you've got that point down, it's, it's there and it's done, and you can forget about it, and it's easy to sleep at night. And then when you've got those points, as things start to, I hope, gel together into, into obvious groupings. So I was putting down these points, and you can see how the do's and don'ts section started to materialise. And it's something that I did for my PhD thesis, and it's something I did again last year where <laughs> I had to write a dissertation of my own for the teacher training that I'm doing at the same time as this lot. So little and often, little and often. Start early and it's easy then. And it unburdens you. And you don't get and you don't get that dreadful thing at the very last minute when you're oh no, I'll have to put that in. So it really helps. So scheduling. Start early. And it doesn't have to be hugely early. As I say, give yourself a few weeks and you start straight away. So really, this, this slide's a restatement of the same thing, really. So if, especially if you're working on a group project uh, and a group report, just 
get together and scribble everything down. Some people like to just write it onto, onto a PC. Some people like to have a whiteboard or a, or a flip chart or something like that. Everything you want to get written down. Slam it down there on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be neat, it can just be scribbled. I remember the example I was given was turn a piece of A4 paper sideways and then scribble it down. That seems, to, and that stops you being too misty about it, you know. You can just have groups of stuff and draw circles around. And then you can start pushing things together into the groups. And the next thing you know, the project's almost written itself in note form. And all you've got to then do is sort of parse through it, converting it into meaningful English and things like that. So here's an example of this is a paper that I'm writing with a chap from Airbus. We hardly ever meet, but we've just got this document. We're just ping pong backwards and forwards between us, editing it, fiddling them out with it. And it comes up brilliantly. And so you might even set up a wiki or something like that, if that's what you want to do. But most of the time, because you're physically co-located, you can get together and just chuck things down. But have a central document, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. <coughs> so you'll notice I'm not actually talking very much about the content. And that's deliberate, because... <coughs> The content's useful, but I think it's something that's fairly clear to everybody already. But I just want to go over it anyway. Most of the main points you want to make are the ones of management. So what are you, what are you trying to say? And this is particularly true of M level now. What have you done? Or what have you discovered? So tell me what's been achieved. And it's surprising how, how often people forget to put that down. And then you want to put it in context. How does it relate to what we as a species know already? How does it fit in? Why is it reasonable? And also, why, why, is, the, why is what we've done of any interest? Why is it significant? So this is particularly important for master's level there. Why is it useful as well? So if you could start going on to PhD and things like that. And also, here's the other point, what went right and wrong particularly. All these ideas, they're, they're probably not perfect. How can they be? Definitely admit to the, to the shortcomings of an idea and admit to how it's incomplete. That shows analysis. It does, it's not a sign of weakness, quite the reverse. It just goes to show that you've got, you understand that this is an incomplete piece of work and nothing else will help you get your funding next time round. So what would you do better next time? So that demonstrates not only were you able to identify the shortcomings in the project or the exercise, but you've actually got an idea about how to fix them. So very, very important. This is something I really want to stress. I'm going to say it over and over again a few times in this talk. There is nothing wrong, quite the reverse, with talking about what went wrong and what, went, what we had is what failed. I've had loads and loads of survivors finding your project where I've been sat in the vibe and I've said, well, why didn't you do this? And the person goes, oh, I did, but it didn't really work properly, so I didn't like to talk about it. Ah! Get it down. That's, in many ways, that's the most useful thing you can say in a report. Because that pot stops the next poor sap having to make the same mistake next time round. I've had mates and their entire PhDs have been essentially the conclusion is, yeah, I got this method to work and I tried it on trying to identify galaxies or whatever, but nah, it's not really the best way. <laughs> it must have been heartbreaking to write that in a the, in the thesis, but he still got his doctorate. So then there's the report style, sort of how you talk about it. Now, although we, talk about, well, although we say report here, we say project report and things like that, <coughs> we're not really writing a project report as I know it at, in, in, in an industrial sense, which is very dry, very much just a listing of facts or procedures and things like that. We're looking for more of a dissertation And the difference between a report and a dissertation, I think, is this concept of analysis and reflection. Uh, the other piece of jargon that we're always taught in the teacher training is critical evaluation. 
So critical evaluation is particularly important for masters. And so that reflection is all that point that I made earlier about what went right, what went wrong, why it went right, why it went wrong, how it fits with the rest of human knowledge, and what you'd do better next time, or what you would do if you carried on with your project. And you guys have already had experience of that as you've moved from your third year to move forward to your fourth year project, your master's level project. Personally, I think the passive voice is a better way to say it. Don't use personal pronouns. This example here is this dissertation I was talking about, uh, talking to you about, about my ADP. I'll be honest, I didn't put a huge amount of effort into it because I've got my day job to do, but I got 60% for this. And it wasn't actually a huge amount of work because I followed that procedure of starting, I knew when the, when the date was, so four weeks beforehand, open myself, brand new blank word file, and just got those points down. And in fact, when I actually came to write it, virtually all I had to do was to start inserting the thus and rewrite it as a meaningful text rather than just slightly terse notes. And so it really <coughs> saved my bacon, that one bit. So yeah, and, and that, that style as well. It was rather entertaining. The, the guy who marked it came along, I met him and he said, yeah, that was, a, that was a good dissertation. Oh yeah, you the guy who talks about himself in the third person who calls himself Dr. Wright. He was quite entertained by that. But that was because I'd already started with eyes and knees and I thought, nah, it doesn't quite give it that heft. So it's up to you. But I recommend the passive voice. It gets you very, it will also get you trained up for if you ever you start writing academic papers and things like that in the future. And I certainly hope you guys will be. So just to talk about the, uh, the sections. And again, it's not so much the, the what, the content, as the how you go about creating that content that I really want to impress on you. The big one, the big mistake I'm always seeing is lots and lots of good stuff and then conclusions this long at the end. And you can see exactly what's happened. So we started at the beginning, tried to write forwards towards the end, and by the time they've got to the conclusions, they've had enough and they can't be bothered and they dash it off. And it's so obvious that the conclusions were just a quick distillation of the rest of the body. Hold this thought in your mind. Imagine that the reader only ever reads the introduction and the conclusions. And I'll tell you what, that ain't so very far from the truth, actually. Most of the time, in industry, and sometimes in, in quite a lot in academia too, people will do exactly that. You'll read the introduction to find out the what was the question, and then you skip straight forward to the conclusions to find out what the answer was. If they're interested, they'll probably go back and read the middle. But there's a thought. Imagine that you've only got those two things. And so a very good way of doing that is to write the introduction and conclusions first. Now, I take the point. Your, your, your final version of your conclusions might well change as your ideas morph <coughs> during the actual writing process. But that's fine. You can edit it then, you can embellish it, you can change it, but definitely get down the structure of what your conclusion is. So it goes back to this point about what's the narrative that you're trying to make of this thing. Humans like narratives, even when it's an alleged report. So hot tip there, definitely. So as I mentioned before, we, you're usually requested to do a review section, whether it be a literature review or a context review. And this is, a, this is one of these things, another example of something that probably differs from an industrial report. So those of you who worked in industry, this is, this is an interesting point at which the academic report diverges. The key point here is, again, it's that point we were showing was how does what the, well, how does the idea fit into what we already know? 
Does it agree with it or does it conflict with it? Doesn't matter. We're not saying that every idea has to fit with current orthodoxy, otherwise we wouldn't get anywhere and still be in the Middle Ages. But it shows that at least you understand the context and so it, and, and it defines whether you are a, whether you are confirming existing theory and the existing knowledge or adding to it or opposing it even. And I hope one day you'll be in a situation where, where you're saying, no, I think this is wrong. And that's what good science is all about. And the other thing it does is, as I say, is it doesn't really, it's showing that you're not just repeating somebody else's work. Or, if you are repeating it but with a subtle difference, you're acknowledging that, you're, that that work has been done already, and this is how what I have done adds to it and enhances it, and things like that. And then, as I say, coming back to this point about critical evaluation, and again, this is another point at which <coughs> your dissertation or report will diverge from an industrial report. You're, you're flexing your intellectual muscles over the information that you've acquired. So it comes back to this point. What do they do? What do I think about it? What would I do next? What would I do differently if I had the time again? Gosh, life is like that. Have an opinion, but be ready to support your opinion. So everybody's got an opinion, but then, uh, then ask, ask yourself, if, somebody, if you're down the pub and somebody said, why do you believe that? You need to be ready to give a reason. So going back to conclusions, again, I'm restating this thing again, but it is well worth restating. People forget conclusions. And a they are really important. Imagine that the conclusions is probably worth about 10% of the entire mark. So that's quite, that's quite a, a thought when you put it in that, in that is context. So people are always forgetting to do decent conclusions because by the time they get there, they're so burned out and fed up, me included, that you just can't shut it out or you're out of time. So the way to get around that one, as I say, write conclusions first, even if you change them afterwards. Because this is what I'm always seeing. People leave the conclusions to the end because they'll think, yeah, yeah, it's a sort of summary of everything I've, I've written so far, so I'll get around to it. Oh, and then it's been <coughs> just quite slips away. So maybe the best way to think about it is it's the other way around, where Instead of the conclusions being the distillation of the main body, the main body is the expansion and justification, the foundation of the point that you've got in your conclusions. And that really goes back to this point here as well. Conclusions shouldn't start throwing in any new facts. They should just be a restatement and an emphasis of those new facts. You do see that a lot when people suddenly come up with this factoid in, in the conclusions. You go, Hang on. You haven't told me about that yet. So bear that one in mind, definitely. Now here's another one people are always asking me about. Oh, does the word, does the word count include appendices? And I'm, being, I'm going to give you a really rubbish answer here, a really woolly answer. Generally, it doesn't. Now, the general rule there is, in my mind, is the appendix, the material you put in your appendix, counts if you've written it. So in other words, if, if you've got a data sheet for, for a piece of kit that you use, or a listing of some code, that wouldn't really count. That's just FMI, as it were. If, for example, you've put something in an appendix that you've, that you've written. So uh, a typical example I can think of is, uh, say you've supplied some information or a piece of software or something, and you've written a procedure for unzipping it, installing it on the machine, and running it, and things like that. That's your work, and it's something that the marker needs to needs to look at carefully. 
So that would that would include that would get a be an example of an appendix that goes towards the page count. But a data sheet, I'm going to go. Oh yeah, I know that chip. I, I don't need to look at it. Similarly, I might glance down a software coding to check whether the coding has been written well with good comments and good structuring and things like that. Particularly if it's very very important towards the project itself. But other, but you might just want to put. Maybe if you've got software coding, just the first page or something, you know, the top level functions. You don't need every single line of code. The rest of it could be on a CD in the back of it. So, for example, this goes back to this point about code is a big one people always ask about. You don't have to put all the code in to, to the appendix. You could put, by always put all the code on the CD. But you want to see a sample of how it's written and how it's structured and things like that. So that contributes towards that. So I hope that's made that a little bit clear about appendices, but <laughs> again, it's, it's a yeah, that, name that one. <laughs> now this is one of my bet noir. When you're writing your sections, please, please, please give them section numbers. Otherwise, I just, I open this, we open the report, there's this monolithic code with just random headings along it. And if I squint a bit, I can kind of work out what depth of heading it is by the size of the font on the, uh, on the, on the heading of each section and things like that. But if somebody's just done me a uh, section numbers like that, it's fantastic. The reason for that is that I'm going to be leaping backwards and forwards through the, through the report. Because quite often, I'll read something and I'll go, hang on, let me tell you about, they talked about that earlier, and things like that. So I rifle back through. So you can imagine that is an absolutely essential tool in helping you navigate around. It's very easy to overlook because by the time you've handed that document in, you know that document inside out. But I don't, so uh, have a pity. So this goes back to this thing about appendices, and it usually, and everybody just coming comes up to me and says, "What's the word limit?" Now, some of them we say word limits, and some page limits. Do check the difference. The reason there is a reason for that. I, I tend to put down page limits if I'm expecting a lot of uh, figures and diagrams in the in the text. So, for example, in the last year we were doing fault tree analysis, and there was heartbreak with screenshots of fault trees being dropped into reports all over the place. So there was a page limit. Very tempting <coughs> to just keep going, and want to, yeah, and I appreciate you want to get everything down. But if you really want a little shock to motivate you for getting the for keeping it up like, we're, we're actually officially told to stop reading at the limit. And that typically will chop you off all your appendices, all your, all your conclusions and everything. So, I've never had it in my heart to stop reading at the page limit. But you can, the marks are actually rolling off at that point. Hence, best to wear on the short side if you're going to wear at all. Within limits, obviously. If, I, if, if we've asked for 50 pages, and I get 30 pages, my heart sinks, because I know that ain't because, they get, that ain't because the person's paired the material back, it's because they never had the material in the first place. Lots of figures, great. It's under the same But here's my caveat. Please, please, please. Always, if you've got a figure, it needs to be referenced in the text to, 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 to put it in. Otherwise, it's just a random picture in there. So, yeah, here's, here's your ATO, and here's my girlfriend, isn't she lovely? 
at the same time. So make sure you put it in, because that explains why you've got why you've got that picture. And it also lets you understand how it fits into that narrative. And it's because sometimes say it's dropped over onto the other page or something like that. You need to look forward slightly and things like that. So please, 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 no floating figures. Always reference. This example here is from an academic paper I've been writing. Similarly for tables, tables are good. There's loads of places where, you know, instead of a big load of rather turgid prose, of descriptive prose, you could have something down in the table. And that crops up in systems engineering and things like that all the time, and it? And, it and it was really convenient. Same thing though, please do make sure that that table is referenced to say what the relevance of it is. You might want to, you might want to include some, re uh, some di discussion and description of a table by all means, or, or a figure. And that's fine, and that goes back to that point I was making about, about evaluation and added value to the raw data. So, you've written your, your report, ask yourself these questions, well, uh, make these checks. Is the material relevant? I know it breaks your heart when you've got stuff that appears irrelevant in it and there's nowhere to put it in. Don't just shove it in anyway. Be ruthless about throwing it out. It feels like deciding which one of your kids you're going to send to the orphanage and it hurts, but you're going to have to do it anyway. Sorry about that. You've got some results, and the simplest thing is, did it work? Was it any good? And the answer, no, is a valid answer, don't forget. Don't be shy to say it didn't work, but be ready to understand why and discuss why. I cannot state that strongly enough. Coming across it all the time. Very, very valuable knowledge. In many ways, that's some of the most useful information you can impart to your peers and people who come after you is, don't bother with this. Seems like a good idea, but here's three reasons why in practice you get stuck. Very useful. So in other words, that goes back to this point about make sure, making sure it's relevant. Throw away stuff that's irrelevant, but failure and lessons learned is very relevant. The other one's references, and this goes back to this thing about, um, uh, about reviews as well. Don't worry about referencing stuff. And don't worry about reusing people's previous work. That's what science is all about. That's what good science and good engineering does. Is it stands on the shoulders of giants. So it's, very, it's fine to do that. But if you don't, but there is one thing that you need to be absolutely certain of, and that you do reference that, and you acknowledge that previous work. There's a massive difference between the two. If you reference it and acknowledge it and describe it and say, yes, we've extended it, that is good engineering. The opposite of that is plagiarism. And plagiarism happens a lot. And the other thing we can't believe is how often people think that plagiarism won't be detected. It's so easy in the de in the, in, to detect plagiarism in the <coughs> age of the modern filters and cross-referencing websites and things like that. All we have to do is upload the file, and it will check for similar strings and whatnot. And Wikipedia, come on, you can do better than that. Fair play, Wikipedia is an excellent way of finding the information. And generally, fair play, it's, it's actually been discovered that on the whole, Wikipedia is, is often more accurate than traditional reference books that, you, that would have been referenced in the past. I would tend to say, by all means, find your facts, your basic facts from Wikipedia, but then go back to the source material and cite that. Because that Wikipedia 
material has been generally written by somebody who's, who's gathered it from the primary source. And if I see a lot of Wikipedia references at the back, my heart sinks. Because it shows that, you, that somebody is not trying hard enough. Now this is a good one for group management, uh, for group reports. Uh, I wish I could have had given you this talk last year, but it was discovered the hard way. If you do the group report, it's a really good idea to have a quote editor. It's not so not so much the group manager as the editor, as they're just a single point of contact for all these points. That editor brings all the stuff together. They don't just collate it and slap it together at the last minute. They make sure that it actually fits together as a narrative. So you pass them the raw material and they put it through. And the person who's doing that needs to be credited with that work because it's not, it's not trivial. And it requires, it requires a certain skill as well. And there's other there's other points. It needs to fit together as a narrative. It also needs to fit together as a piece of literature as well. It also, this editor, needs to make sure that they've got the right one. Let me tell you about how that doesn't always happen. But, oh, the editor screwed up is not a valid excuse. At the end of the day, <laughs> if you want to exonerate yourself, from blame, you need to check, you need to read through that report. It's not the editor's problem. It might be the editor's fault, but it's not the editor's problem. It's everybody's problem. It doesn't take long for the editor. The editor can email it all out to everyone and say, read this through. If there's anything you're not happy with, tell me. Resounding silence will be taken as a, as a yes, I'm happy with it, but don't come squealing to me afterwards that there was a mistake because I was down the pub. So the editor, they put it all together, they do their best, but ultimately it's your report as well. Now here's a good one. Going back to this whole thing about presentation and things. All these little things. This is the thing that makes my teeth grind. Because it just goes to show they haven't read nobody's read it. Somebody's whacked that off and printed it off without looking through in detail. And it's very easy to do. And it's a real giveaway that the rest of the report's probably going to be sloppy as well. Because if somebody's made such a crass error as that then there's probably going to be others as well. Spelling errors in the age of the spool chucker. Don't do it, come on. <laughs> page numbers, all this sort of stuff. There was once an age when it was hard to do. This is not that age now. You've got tools to do it, use those tools properly. Find out how to use them. Printed off early again goes to this thing about don't leave it till the last minute. The actual final version as well. I don't know about you. Maybe the PlayStation, PlayStation generation is different, but I can review a document on the on the screen as much as I like. But the moment I print it off, just typeface galore leap off the page at me. Just does my head in. That. I, maybe it's just a, an age thing. I don't know. <laughs> but. I recommend trying to find out whether, you, whether you're one of those people. But a lot of people I do notice, you print off and you still get those problems turning up. So we've got lots of foreign nationals here, and that's excellent. I fully appreciate how it is working on, in foreign language, trying to do two things at once. So if you're not a native speaker, an uh, English speaker, Definitely. Just ask someone to proofread it for you. Or you can pay people to proofread it as well. The other week, I was proofreading a paper by one of our Chinese professors. 
which brings it home again, that I didn't need to be technically a fail the subject to be able to tell whether you know, it needed the and things like that. I appreciate for people who, who a lot of foreign speakers, particularly Far Eastern or Oriental languages, the use of the word the in English seems to be absolutely random. So just get someone to check it for you. And that's true for a lot of the Brits as well. Just have it proofread. And it's very hard to proofread your own work. So why not swap with your mate and things like that? Easily done. Does it, you can do it with sort of half brain off, really. You just have to read it. You don't have to understand it. You just have to read the sentences and see whether it sounds right. All those little mistakes. And it comes back to this thing about um, little mistakes that you wouldn't imagine until you print it off. Finally, you get more management. I just can't believe in the age of gigabyte memory sticks and cloud storage, how many people make this mistake, failing to back up. My preferred solution here is I zip things up, rename them after the day, and then just store them on a sideways document, uh, on a stick somewhere, or on the cloud, on your, on your Dropbox, or something like that. So rename sideways, keep those versions, because usually the worst enemy is yourself. You accidentally stomp all over the, the, the right version, and you suddenly realize you made a fish or something, and you want to go back to the previous version. So I tend to do this time seven things. There's, I mean, for source code and things, there's actually control, there's, there's special tools available and things like that, but we're talking about documents today. And so you can probably just store it sideways because a document is so small that you can have a zillion copies scattered around. But having said all that, in the age of all these backups, you, the, the headache of making sure that you've got backups is now replaced by the headache of making sure you're doing your version control correctly. So make sure you've got those timestamps or some sort of note about what the difference is about each of those. Otherwise, you really get into a state. And I learned that one the hard way. But yeah, this is one of my directories on my memory stick, and I turn it back, I turn it to the cloud. As I say, the danger there is you start to forget which one is which. So I work by day, but put in a ring the bell, really. So let's put it all together and just a few cautionary tales of things that I've seen in a mere 12 months. So just to, just to hold, that, hold this thought. So one I saw last year was the report had been printed off at midnight. The entire members <coughs> section has been left out. So that's a classic example of editor made a mistake, but that person perhaps should have read that article and read through that report. And they would have been two seconds flat, they would have gone, hang on, where's my bit? So useful lesson there. This is one I saw in a finding year report. Nobody that you'd know, different department. Excellent project. But the guy had been warned, failed to reference some really important work, which at a stroke converted his excellent research into serious plagiarism. And he had been warned and very nearly got failed instead of, you know, 60-70% styling marks because of plagiarism. It's something that, as, a, as an academic institution, we have to be seen to come down like a ton of bricks on that. I'm not sure what happened at the end. So that was a close call for him. This is what I saw. I can't remember whether it was your year or the year before. The group report was clearly just a random set of 
Everybody just scattered, done their research, 11.59, met up, slapped them all back to back. There was holes in it, there was, there was duplication in it. Clearly there, ha there wasn't an editor hardly. Somebody had just been picked on to slap it all together and collate it at the end. And so it clearly just showed that it wasn't a group report. It was just a series of continuous separate articles had been written. Don't do that. It's so easy to do, as I say, and it's so easy just to have your editor that pulls all that together. Here's a good one. Conflict control. Somebody submitted the 10, the, the 10 day version and failed. It was a fail. Fortunately, we managed to re salvage the situation. So in other words, remember, it's easy to do backup. Conflict control then becomes your concern. Make sure you've backed up the right thing. So as I say, time stuff is invaluable. T whole 10 days of work, solid work, that, that wasn't there. It's picked up the wrong file version. And this is the worst one. <laughs> Nobody in this room. The guy freaked out, decided his report was a complete load of rubbish, deleted whole sections of it at 4 a.m., woke up in the morning with the reality and thought uh, where common sense had prevailed at last. Oh, uh, he lost it, the whole thing. Now, here's the twist to this corner, to this, co to this story, is that story and that story was the same guy with the same report. <laughs> So, bear in mind, you've just spent a gazillion hours on this thing. You've spent three months getting to this point, chatting <laughs> with the person of your dreams. Yeah, you've got like that. You then rock up for dinner. 100%. Are you, that's, yeah. 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 That's the swine. That's the <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't take long to comb your hair and shine your shoes, in other words, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so let's just sum up. And, and as, it, as I've said, the, the, the thing that I suspect you'll find surprising about this talk is I haven't really spoken much about content. And where I have spoken about it, content, it's to do with how you manage that content. Because I believe by this point, you're already getting pretty good at creating content. The big mistakes, the big, oh, oh moments when I'm marking something, definitely in that management thing. Silly mistakes of information left out, irrelevant information left in, silly proofreading and conflict control issues. So in other words, report writing, it's often about that management thing. That's, and I've seen some great reports, some great material, often let down by daft mistakes like that. And just a few, few rules like this, and that's exactly what this talk, I hope, has done for you. So to hold it in mind, you only need these few simple tricks, and it will make your report better, but, and here's the really, this is the bit that I like, and I certainly was reminded of when I did my dissertation with the, um, the teacher training, is it makes it easier as well. It makes your life easier. It means you can sleep at night without fretting that you've muffed it somewhere. And it gives you a feeling that you're progressing evenly towards it. And a good report is easy marks. I think it's like 10, it's like 10 marks out of thin air just by applying a few, you know, well-disciplined rules and things like that. So I hope that's helped. Any questions? <laughs> I'm a bit stunned. I'll just uh, close that.